And now I ask you please to join me in welcoming Dean Mark Wigley. Great pleasure to be here. Um, and a real pleasure to be in dialogue with Eduardo Pais, who's absolutely not a boring person. <laughs> um, and and um, Rio's not a boring place. Actually, it's such a pleasure. If you look up the word pleasure in the encyclopedia, it says, see Rio. Um, <laughs> But it's not just pleasure, it's also serious work. I think in, in Rio you have one of the most important laboratories for thinking about the future of cities. So we are here not just to be uh, tourists, this is a serious place, a place for serious work. And we have a huge uh, issue facing us. In the year 2050, seven billion people will be living in cities and absolutely nobody knows what that means. And I'm supposed to be an expert and all of my friends are experts, I can tell you we don't know. No one knows. That means the city of our grandchildren, for some of you the city of your children, is a completely unknown thing. For most people it looks like a huge set of problems. Technical, ethical, social, ecological, energy, ideas, sustainability, all of this. Problem, problem, problem. It's the biggest experiment in human history and we could think of it as a set of problems, but we could also think of it as a, an, amazingly, a, an amazing opportunity. M maybe, maybe cities are the single best invention of the human species. So maybe instead of saying we have a huge problem, we could say we have a huge opportunity. In the year 2050, we will have more of this amazing asset than we have ever had before. So the question is, what is it that's so amazing about cities, so, so precious, that we would want, like to maximize in the year 2050? And if we start with this idea of what, what we want to maximize, then I think we can address the problems of today and reverse engineer and, and decide what kind of decisions today would maximize the city in the future. And I think if we take this approach, all of the technical, ethical, social problems can be addressed very, very uh, uh, directly. But this cannot be done alone. Uh, the question of, of, of the city is a, is a, is a collaborative question. It's a, it's a global question. So we have one of our most important research bases uh, of the School of Architecture here in Rio de Janeiro. We are a school with students from 60 different countries, faculty from all these different countries. We work everywhere in the world. But probably we do our most serious work here in, in, in Rio uh, for many reasons. But in the network that we have, Rio, Istanbul and Mumbai are all cities on the water. And you can argue that if you really want to take seriously the question, what is the city of the future, think about the cities on the water. The reason I love the idea that we talk today with the mayors, mayors are more important than presidents. It's true. Uh, cities are more important than nations. Cities are uh, the engine of con contemporary life. Seven billion people are racing towards cities for a reason. I believe the reason is generosity. Cities, if you look at them in the negative sense, they are full of problems and they're full of unevenness. They're full of a lack of generosity. But actually, the secret of a city is that it creates uh, opportunities and openings. Cities are simply places to share your life. They are machines for sharing. And machines for sharing, like all forms of sharing, maximize uh, potentials, maximize our opportunities, maximize imagination. Cities are kind of amplifiers of hu human uh, ambition. So cities always have this uh, potential to release something new to the very, the very production sites, the industrial sites for, for imagination. And this is very uh, crucial. You could say, what is a city? A city is a very, very dense, hyper-dense cosmopolitan mix. That means you, you share your life with somebody different than you. Because they are different from you, can't predict what they will say. They will say something not exactly what you think. You become a different person in a city. You grow. You become yourself in a city. Most people think that when they go to a city, they become themselves for the first time. And they become themselves because they share with people very, very different. So cosmopolitan density is a form of generosity. So if a mayor is an important person, it's because the mayor is responsible for generosity. We can judge mayors according to the kinds of generosity they create, the kinds of hospitality, and not just for their own uh, city, because of course all cities today are connected to every other city. This is the connections of the shipping, but we could talk about connections of the airplanes, connections of money, uh, of, of energy, of ideas, or, or, of images, and most important, of people that are circulating. So there is probably no such thing today as a local mayor. You cannot simply be the mayor of Rio. If you are the mayor of Rio, you are also somehow the mayor of a global city, which is itself a biodiverse, complex, dense uh, imagination machine. But probably we can also argue the reverse, that a city can only be generous if each of its neighborhoods is also generous. Each neighborhood has to be a kind of miniature city. Uh, in each of the different neighborhoods of Rio, 
there has to be a kind of uh, engine of, of, of creativity and life and, 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 and vitality. That means each uh, micro neighborhood has to be also a kind of a miniature city. And this is especially true if you are on the edge, and Rio is on the edge, on the edge of the water. The amazing thing about Rio is when Rio is first uh, uh, discovered, it already has the architecture, the architecture, the skyscrapers of the mountains. So basically, when you design a city for Rio, you are adding a kind of human architecture to a natural architecture. And if you know a little bit the history of Rio, many of the mountains were taken down to create the space uh, 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 of the city. In this sense, perhaps Rio is one of the most uh, modern cities in the world. It's a, a invented. It's a kind of a creation on the edge. And of course, it's exactly on the edge where you have the space of exchange. So if cities are based on cosmopolitan density and creativity, uh, uh, that comes through exchange. Sharing is also exchange. So the, the port area of this city is an ex astonishingly interesting site for thinking about the future, not only the future of the city of Rio, but the future of cities in general. Because of course, it's an industrial land that was uh, invented. Actually, the history of the port area is more or less the same as the history of the position of the mayor, because they make uh, uh, the port area is a reclaimed land from the beginning of the 20th century, which is also the beginning of the Republic, when the mayor is mayor of uh, capital, and then from the 1960s, mayor of, of, the, of the city of Rio. So in a, in a certain way, when the mayor is thinking about the port area, is thinking about uh, modern Rio, the Rio in which there is a, such a figure as a mayor, and it is exactly this space of exchange that is no longer used because now the goods and transport are in electronics and airplanes and so on, a fantastic site for reinventing and reimagining the future of Rio. But the city of the future is also the city of the past. So of course, exactly in the port area, you have the slave port of uh, uh, 1811, where half a million Africans arrive to this site, many of whom die and are buried at this site, a kind of tra tragedy, uh, a deep tragedy, but also a deep tragedy that gives birth to samba, a kind of uh, statement of pleasure in the face of the pain. So an amazing, you could not imagine a more, uh, a more of an acupuncture point for the, hi for the history of this city than the port area. So of course the port area has to have uh, history, has to have innovation, has to have business, has to have culture, has to have housing, has to have public space, has to have uh, 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 all of these things. But also has to have what you cannot expect, what you cannot predict. So there has to be a plan. Every, every mayor has to be an architect. I mean, I like architects. So it's a good thing. Uh, architect means you think of the future. You think what is the possible form of hospitality of the future. You, create, you have to be, create a form of hospitality that allows the future to arrive, and the future to arrive is a new form of hospitality. And hospitality is when you invite a stranger into your house, and it's really a stranger, which means you don't know what will happen. Maybe your life is at risk, your language is at risk, maybe your heart, your emotions are at risk, and you welcome the stranger, and together you share an evening, a meal, a drink, uh, and in that moment, you become a different person. So the mayor has to plan for a miniature city on the edge, on the edge between the land and the water, a city that will, a small city that has everything in it that makes a city amazing, and that means also a small city that will be un unpredictable. We, we, we don't know what will happen in that place. Generosity, I will insist, is a matter of design. It's something that can be designed. Hospitality is something that can be understood and, and created. It's what cities are, are, are for. Now, of course, being a city on the edge, we can learn lessons from other cities on the edge. So I thought it would be interesting for us to listen to the voice of the directors of Studio X in, in Mumbai, first of all, and then in Istanbul, and then in Rio, just to listen to the sound of whether the mayors of the other cities that are in a similar situation to Eduardo are coming up with uh, interesting questions in, in, the, in the face of this uh, uh, dilemma. which translates literally to extremely big heart. For myself, the phrase most clearly refers to Mumbai herself, and what this city has given those who have chosen to become an integral part of its existence. Whether you consider its strategic location, its shorelines, its natural resources, its allowed population of over 16 million people, opportunity beyond what would be thought capable in one's lifetime. The generosity also extends itself to define the people of Mumbai and their unfathomable ability to give to people in need. But to exist and be justified in its intent, this bullet but adil, or generosity, requires reciprocity to mediate the balance. Besides a handful of spaces, the waterfronts of Mumbai as a whole 
or losing their ability to give as rapid, uncontrolled growth threatens the very existence of the city. A project done recently in collaboration with artist Swazik Gwazinek at Studio X Mumbai, Happy Owners, focused on the relationship between urban development and nature. For Mumbai, natural buffers between the sea and the land need to be considered as integrated strategies within urban development. So that's a, uh, an amazing example of how the Studio X works. The Studio X is just a place, a neutral place, in which all forms of knowledge are welcome. So it's a form of hospitality, amazing coffee and amazing conversation. Uh, Rajiv, a great young architect, thinking, thinking the, 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 the future. Now Selva, great, great young architect, thinking the future of Istanbul. Hi, this is Salva Gurdon, director of Studio X Istanbul. Istanbul occupies a natural border between two continents and has close to 375 kilometers of shoreline. This natural border, known as the Bosphorus or the Turkish Strait, is busy not only because it lies between the densely populated urban areas offering home to more than 14 million people in official numbers, but also because of the thousands of ships that pass through it every year, making it the second busiest strait in the world. Daily life in Istanbul is also busy. Pockets of tranquility can be found in its turmoil, but it is seldom a prolonged moment or a continuous space. Perhaps to overcome this, Istanbul city officials expanded the city onto the sea with long stretches of landfill trucks and boardwalks throughout the decades. One of the first projects of this type was the Dolmabahce Palace at the end of the Ottoman Empire. Dolmabahce literally means a landfill garden. The sea and the land continue to be generous to people. So Istanbul, of course, an amazing, uh, an amazing place. If you dig a hole in Istanbul, you find another civilization. To have the best young minds of Istanbul in conversation with the best young minds of Rio is the beginning of some new way to uh, think the future. At Rio, of course, amazing. Uh, Pedro Rivera, the fantastic director of Studio X uh, here in Plaza Chirrientes. My name is Pedro Rivera. I'm Carioca, architect and director of Studio X Rio. In Portuguese, generosity translates into generosidade. Rio de Janeiro is generous with its sunny days, warm afternoons, and a natural landscape of incredible beauty. The word generosidade can be associated with how we relate to each other, to our ability to cope and integrate different cultures, and quickly accept newcomers also as cariocas, as we say here. But living in cities takes effort. In Rio, the territory is disputed, and the notion of public and private goods are not always evenly valued. Large number of favelas, or slums, and the dispute between public and private transportation are some examples. To live generously in its fullness requires new actions and responsibilities. Recently, Studio X produced with Transporte Ativo and ITDP Brazil a proposal for a creation of bike routes in the city center. The proposal suggests a new alternative mobility to the area, cheap, practical, sustainable, and above all, more generous in the use of urban space. It will complement, in the small scale, the major ongoing investments on infrastructure that will link the downtown and the port area to the rest of the city. Maybe when it's all said and done, it's easier to be generous on two wheels than on four. So it's great. So let's just to return to the question I think we can discuss with, with, with Eduardo. The globalization is absolutely not new. Globalization is super misunderstood and it is a very, very long uh, uh, process. The first world map, the first scientific world map is drawn by uh, Diogo Ribeiro. He's a Portuguese who's making these maps for the Spanish. He makes the first global map, the first accurate map, uh, in 1527, based on information coming from the first circumnavigation of the world by Magellan. Actually, Magellan, the navigation the tools, the equipment that, that Magellan has, were, was designed by, by Diogo Ribera. Ribera starts to make a map of the world. This is the first one, which comes in, in 1527. This is just a section. And what I want you to notice about the map is, what is known in this map, what is understood, what is familiar is the water. The water is mathematical, geometric, is known. What's unknown is the land. You have already the beginning of, uh, of the continent, uh, but the continent is just a line, a line between the water which is known and the land which is not known. The name of Brazil has already arrived, but look, the whole side of the continent is a mystery. It's unknown. Brazil is something without dimension. Brazil is a kind of a question. By the way, I think that didn't change. 
uh, it's a really long, long journey from uh, New York to, to, to Rio, but it's even longer to go from Rio to any city in Brazil, because Brazil is like, it was invented to, do, to defeat any kind of measure or any kind of uh, uh, control. It is like an ocean in which swim very different cities with very, very different uh, lives. And this is before we go into the Amazon, the great image of the, of, of the mystery. So again, if you think of Rio de Janeiro, it's positioned here, this port invented in the 20th century, a 20th century attempt to redraw the same line that was drawn by, by Diego Rivera in the, at the beginning of the 16th century, the space of exchange. But between the world of international trade and the mysterious world of, of, uh, uh, of Brazil. So here we are in Rio, between two huge oceans, a green ocean and a blue ocean. And always Rio has had a kind of responsibility to present to the world some kind of image or some kind of imagination about what is this thing, this impossible thing, Brazil. I think it's still the case today. So adding to everything I said before, it is as if all of the magic of Rio will be invested now in the port area, it also has to represent Brazil, which was of course the responsibility of Rio officially when it was the capital. Now it's still the emotional responsibility. So this place, this port area, has to be the place in which an image of a possible future uh, uh, of Rio is, is, uh, is, is thought about. And this means a plan, but also it will be a Brazilian city, of course. And the thing about the Brazilians, and why probably the, you will win the World Cup, is that Brazilians have a team like everybody else. Same number of players. The problem is, with the Brazilian team, you don't know where the ball is. You cannot imagine. Exactly where you think it will be, it's somewhere else. So probably what will happen is, there has to be the invention in the port area of a new kind of idea about the city, which has built into it the kind of Brazilian unpredictability and at this moment, it's absolutely not a moment for Rio to receive wisdom from the rest of the world, one more colonial uh, source of inspiration. This is the moment in, in which Rio can generate new concept of what cities can be, new concepts of performance and, uh, and uh, uh, behavior. And it is my opinion that this experiment here in Rio is of urgent relevance uh, 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 around the world. This is a global uh, uh, issue. But globalization does not mean homogenization. Globalization actually means very, very specific issues in specific places. Rio probably has a catalog of all of the major problems facing cities today. It's, there's probably not a problem you don't have. And you don't have in a big supersize. So you have the supersized problems, and I think you also have the supersized uh, opportunities to address those uh, uh, problems. And maybe this is the definition of an architect. An architect is somebody who, in the face of terrible conditions, and impossible situations uh, has optimism. Uh, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very special moment when you have a mayor that's totally aware of the problems, but is also maintaining a kind of architect's uh, uh, optimism. My simple point is, is that the, the real test of Rio will not be now, but will be for our grandchildren, will be when some of the most amazing things in this city happen exactly in the port area. Every time I come to Rio, I learn that the port project has changed and there's a new element. In my opinion, every time a new element is added to that project, it gets better and better and better because it starts to become a, 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 a city. Um, and just to finish, we are in, in a situation of an, an enormous transformation of the global economy that has been a huge expansion of wealth, a huge expansion of the middle class, but also a huge expansion of, of, of unevenness, of inequity. And, and so I think exactly in, the, in this moment, exactly in facing uh, the need for a new kind of city, a new kind of imagination, also a new kind of uh, social justice, all of this must be uh, absolutely urgently addressed here in this uh, city. And we consider it an enormous honor to be here in this laboratory, in this place, which is no longer the place that will be discovered from a long distance away by people with somewhat suspect uh, motives. This is a moment in which the world could listen to Rio and listen very, very carefully. And uh, I don't know, my sense is uh, uh, it's going to be amazing. Uh, it's going to be hard. This question of the city of the future is not easy. No one has a solution. I believe the only way we will address this issue is by new forms of sharing. The Studio X network is precisely an architecture of sharing in which all forms of knowledge are relevant and, and, and needed, in which every member of society, in theory, has equal, equal uh, voice. And I think that experiment is best here, uh, uh, in Rio, which is why I say it's a great pleasure to be here, but it's an unbelievably serious 
work. I, I think Rio is the most serious uh, city on, on our planet in this uh, moment. So today we're having, I think, an important discussion. Um, thanks for your time. <laughs>